In the last chapter, we have seen the axioms of set theory and how to use them for building finite sets or certain large sets. However, the objective of set theory is not to only study sets, but to encode the entire mathematical universe into sets. This chapter is about one of such basic mathematical objects, the Cartesian product. Cartesian product is mostly an interlink between the formal world and many more advanced objects such as the set of points in the plane, matchings, functions or directed graphs. My original intention was to show both parts in one video, the chapter 10, but this chapter grew bigger over time and I also have to admit that both parts are about relatively independent topics. So I have decided to split chapter 10 into part A, where we are going to see what a Cartesian product is good for, and part B, where we are going to construct it in the formal world of sets. I have to admit that a bit weird numbering of the chapters is partly because of my laziness, as I didn't want to change the chapter numbers in videos I have prepared before. But another reason is that the order of the two parts of chapter 10 is not entirely clear. It was a bit of a dilemma to choose the order of the two parts. I have decided to start with applications that I consider more interesting, but you will have to just imagine that the Cartesian product is something already living in the formal world of sets and wait for the justification for the next video. Alternatively, you can pause this video now, watch part B first to learn where the Cartesian product comes from and after that go back to see what such a thing is good for. Here, let's start with a definition. Take two sets, A and B. Cartesian product A times B is the set of all the possible ordered pairs where the first element comes from set A and the second one comes from set B. An ordered pair is denoted by parentheses and the Cartesian product A times B is written with a cross, not with a dot. For clarity, we can arrange set A into a row, set B into a column, and the elements of A times B into a table, columns of which correspond to the elements of A, and rows correspond to the elements of B. First, it is quite clear why the Cartesian product is called a product. It indeed multiplies the sizes of sets A and B. That is one of the first definitions of multiplication one encounters in elementary school. Given a fixed number of elements in a row and the number of rows, the number of all the elements is the product of the two numbers. And second, there is a clear connection to the Cartesian coordinates of points in the plane. When we take the product of the set of real numbers with another set of real numbers, we obtain the entire plane in our visualization. Any point in this plane is a pair of two real numbers which determine its x and y coordinates. Such an assignment of points in the plane to pairs of real numbers is called the Cartesian coordinate system and we are showing it here as one example usage of the Cartesian product. It is actually also the historical reason why we call the Cartesian product Cartesian. However, the Cartesian product itself plays a much more important role than just the basis for geometry. We have started this series about set theory by taking two sets and comparing their sizes by matching their elements. If there is a matching between two sets, the two sets are of the same cardinality. But in the world of sets there are only sets so far, the word matching hasn't been invented yet. To talk about matchings in the formal world of sets, we need to define which set such a matching correspond to. Formally, a matching is the set of connections between sets A and B. What is a connection? An ordered pair. So matching is a subset of the Cartesian product A times B. Of course, not any subset of the Cartesian product is a matching. It is defined as such a subset of the Cartesian product, such that every element of set A is at exactly one left position and every element of set B is at exactly one right position. That is the entire formal definition of a matching. However, maybe surprisingly, the word matching is rather an unusual terminology for set theory. Instead of it, people typically use the word bijective function, which has the very same formal meaning. Why? A standard function is something that gets a real number x, it processes it with some formula, let's say 2 minus x squared halves, and spits out the result, fx. 
So if we plug in, say, number 3, it gives us 2 minus 3 squared halves, that is, 2 minus 9 halves equals minus 2 and half. We often plot graphs of such functions. For every x-coordinate, such as 3, we calculate the function value, minus 2 and half in this case, and we plot this value as the y-coordinate. We consider all the possible values for x and we draw a subset of the Cartesian plane looking as a curve going from the left to the right. However, in general, functions first don't have to be prescribed by a formula and second, they don't have to convert real numbers to real numbers. In general, we have a function from a general set A to a set B that is denoted like this. We can imagine the function as a black box which, given an element of A, somehow determines an element of B. We can plot the graph even for such a function. We construct the Cartesian product A times B, and for any x coordinate, we find the appropriate function value. This yields to a subset of the Cartesian product such that every column contains exactly one element. So far, I was pretending that the graph of the function, that is a subset of the Cartesian plane, and the function itself, some magic black box transforming A's to B's, are two different things. However, from the perspective of formal set theory, these two are the same. Not only the function is uniquely determined by its graph, a function is the same thing as its graph. The only difference is how we view it. So we could say that every function as a magic box uses the same concrete process. It gets an element of A, looks at the appropriate column and outputs the appropriate element of B. So a function is formally defined as a subset of the Cartesian product such that every column contains exactly one element. That is, every element of set A is at exactly one left position. This is a very similar condition which we have seen for a matching before, only with the difference that the matching requires the same to be true also for set B. Anyway, a matching is just a special case of a function. It is such a function which outputs every element of B exactly once. We can fix the function here by moving the value in the last column. Such a function is then called a bijective function. And you will find mathematicians talking about bijective functions rather than about matchings, although there is no formal difference. It is a fun fact that the domain of mathematics Working rather with matchings than with graph of bijective functions is graph theory. In the graph theory view, we start with the complete bipartite graph A times B. By complete, we mean that there is an edge between every pair AB and bipartite because sets A and B form the two parts. What we call a matching here, and it corresponds to a bijective function, is called a perfect matching in graph theory. It is called perfect in contrast to a partial matching which doesn't have to cover all the vertices. Another graph theoretical object closely related to the Cartesian product is a directed graph. In this case, we start with a single set of vertices V and we take a Cartesian product V times V. A single directed pair of vertices, say V3, V1, is then represented as an arrow from the first vertex to the second one. The entire Cartesian product looks like this. A subset of the Cartesian product then corresponds to an arbitrary directed graph. However, I'm not mentioning directed graphs here only for fun. This view of a Cartesian product is also a pretty nice way to describe an ordering. In the chapters about ordinal numbers, we represented orderings as simply the left to right order. The order in which we have drawn the elements had a mathematical meaning. But this picture should also have a formal meaning, so let's ponder how to encode an ordering using a directed graph. For a finite set, we could simply describe the ordering by a sequence of arrows from the first element to the last one. But with an infinite set, such an approach gets into problems. What arrows should we draw between the points in the real interval from 0 to 1 to distinguish it from all the other orderings of this interval? We cannot just put edges between an element and its neighbors because there are no immediate neighbors of the element. For any point, we find another closer point. However, it doesn't matter too much if we are not trying to be thrifty. When a point doesn't have to have an immediate descendant, let's just draw an arrow to all the points on the right. 
Similarly, we also draw the arrows from all the points on the left. And of course, there will be also other arrows between other points, they just don't fit into this picture. And once we have a working approach in the infinite case, there is no reason to do it differently in the finite case. So even in the example of four elements, there will be more arrows in the end. In general, we obtain a directed graph, such that there is an arrow in one direction between every pair of points, and on the other hand, there are no directed cycles in it. And that is the formal definition of an order. So an ordering is such a set of directed edges that determines the order between every pair of points and contains no cycles. We have another formal object, the ordering. So although we can be used to look at different mathematical objects differently, sometimes we talk about a matching, sometimes about a graph of a function, sometimes about a directed graph or about an ordering, all the four cases are just some special cases of a subset of the Cartesian product. Cool, isn't it? In the B part, we will move from the usage of a Cartesian product to its implementation. We are going to define the ordered pair and we will construct the Cartesian product from axioms. See you then!